All right, thank you. So um, it's really a pleasure to be here this evening. Um, I've had the pleasure to give STAR lectures previously at other locations, but really happy to be in Brussels today. Um, so let me introduce myself a bit more. Uh, my name is Melissa Siegel. I'm a professor of migration studies. Um, I am based at the Master Graduate School of Governance and UNU Merit. Um, uh, some of you might not know that Maastricht University has a direct collaboration with the United Nations University, and it's one of the few places in the world where there's a collaboration with a local university and the United Nations University. I've worked in the area of migration for quite a long time now, obviously in teaching and research, but a lot of, I, I head basically what we do on migration at um, the UNU American School of Governance. And a lot of what we do is doing research to feed into evidence-based policy making. We do a lot of capacity building for governments and international organizations. We work with a lot of European governments, but also governments in Africa and Asia and other places. Um, and also do a lot of research for the UN system and international organizations and also capacity building for them. So I'm happy to talk about any of that also. Um, because this is a STAR lecture, I'm also supposed to give you a little bit of an update on what's going on at Maastricht University, so you have an idea of what's going on there. Um, this is uh, our current community, so I hope, I don't know if you guys can read it at the back, I'll, I'll let you know what it says. So we currently have a bit more than 18,000 students enrolled, so for those of you who are alumni from some time ago, you can see that um, our students have grown quite a bit over the years. We have 18 different bachelor's programs and now 75 different master's programs. So Master University has really been um, expanding over the years. Now more than 50% of our population is also foreign students. We have a bit more than 4,000 staff. About 40% of our academic staff are actually international and uh, around 9% of our support staff or administrative staff are our international staff. We are doing more and more to also make sure that uh, we have the promotion of more female professors also. Still some more work to be done there, but we now have a, 103 female professors and 338 male professors. Where are our alumni living? So we currently have uh, a bit more than 72,000 registered alumni from Maastricht University. Um, uh, about 65% of those are living in the Netherlands, another almost 30% are living in other parts of Europe, and about 5% are living in other parts of the world. You can see here the different faculties where our alumni are currently coming from. FHML is in the first place, then the School of Business, Business and Economics, Faculty of Law, Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, Faculty of Psychology and Neuroscience, and the new Faculty of Sciences and Engineering. So um, many of you might not know that the Faculty of Humanities and Sciences, as it was previously called, has recently been changed into the Faculty of Sciences and Engineering. So now we actually have a, an engineering part of Maastricht University. There's been a lot that we've been doing over the years also to contribute to innovation and to society. We have now um, four Brightlands campuses that is a cooperation between multiple parties in the region. So the Camelot campus, the Smart Services campus, the Maastricht Health campus, and the campus Greenport and Venlo. So we've done a lot of expansion also in the region. We've had more and more patents, patents licenses, and spin-offs, and we've been able to raise over um, 91 million euro in uh, um, additional funding that's not directly related to the government, for instance. Um, uh, we also have a charitable foundation, which is the University Fund Lindbergh, or ZWAL. This is a foundation that was created back in 1965 and supports research and education and uh, um, other things at Maastricht University. It raises and administers funds, awards grants and subsidies, and also tries to serve as a bridge between uh, Maastricht University and society. And one of the things that the University Fund has been doing is called the um, Campaign for Each Other. And there have been a, several projects that have been coming out of this, an animal experience room, plastic recycling machines, um, grants for, for students, and an app for research on women in chronic pain. So there are a lot of different uh, initiatives through this. 
There is a, um, a website in case you're interested. You can also donate um, to this fund. So let's get to the real purpose of why we're here. Uh, I want to talk today about mis myths and misconceptions around migration. So migration is one of these topics that people feel like they know a lot about. Migration is not rocket science, let's be honest. Um, but it's something that people think they know a lot about, when actually what they know a lot about is a lot of misconceptions. So I want to try to talk about some of those. Obviously, I cannot cover all of the myths and misconceptions in migration. I'll talk about some of the big ones today, though. Um, so first of all, how many of you in this room are living in Brussels or the Brussels surrounding area? How many, keep your hands up. How many of you are Belgian? Yeah, okay, so very few of you. So the majority of the people that just had your hands raised are actually migrants in, uh, here in Brussels or here in Belgium. How many of you have actually considered yourself a migrant in the past? A few of you. How many of you thought you were migrants when you went to Maastricht University? Fewer of you. But I'm guessing many of you are not Dutch. Or some of you are, but many of you are not. So we're going to talk already about some misconceptions in that regard. So I'm going to go through uh, around 12 different common misconceptions around migration. So who is a migrant? The main reason for uh, uh, who is a migrant is a misconception. Then a myth and misconception is that the main reason for migration is poverty. Another one is that migration is at an all-time high and accelerating quickly. Another is that refugees make up a large proportion of migrants. Now there is looking at where migrants are being hosted or where they go, a lot of misconceptions around this. A lot of misconceptions around where refugees are hosted and also where migrants come from. And uh, also, there are also a lot of misconceptions about understanding the relationship between migration and development. Uh, and also understanding the real effects migration restrictions have. And there are a lot of mismatches in perceptions and reality of, real, of how many migrants there actually are in countries and of migrant characteristics. So we'll go through some of these. So first, one of the first common myths and misconceptions is just about who a migrant is or who is perceived as a migrant. So when you heard that you were coming or when you knew that you were coming to this lecture, you knew the topic of the lecture, um, what came to your mind when you thought of migrants? So this is going to be interactive, so just shout it out. You don't have to give me an official definition, don't be scared. So when you hear the term migrant, what first comes to mind? Refugees. Refugees, yep, that's a typical one. Someone who left their country of birth. Yes, someone who left their country of birth. <laughs> Anything else? Not expats, actually. Sorry? People looking for work. People looking for work, yeah. Insecurity. Insecurity, yeah. So often the first impression that people have when they hear the term migrant, these are the most common um, answers I get. So people who are from developing countries, people who are poor, people who are unskilled, maybe people coming from Africa, possibly refugees, maybe in a Euro more in a European context, thinking of boats coming across the Mediterranean. So this is kind of the perception in people's minds, but actually migration is so much more. So I'm actually American originally. I'm living in the Netherlands now. And when I talk about migration with people, they usually don't think of me as a migrant. So um, I like to tell uh, a little anecdote about when I first moved to Maastricht. I got in touch with a running group, and it was with lots of highly skilled people. So I'm talking about judges from Maastricht, doctors, really prominent people in the community. And when they asked me what I did, I explained that I work on migration issues. And the response I got back was, oh, you mean Moroccans. Which, to be honest, really shocked me. Not that maybe the general public thinks like that, but that this group of, I would say, more selected, highly skilled people were also having that idea in their mind of who a migrant is. And then when I said, well, we're speaking English, I'm a migrant here too, what do you think they said to me? That's different. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, no, but you're different. Right? So what is implied by that statement? Oh no, you're a good migrant. And when we're talking about migrants, we're talking about bad migrants. Right? So this is already extremely problematic. That somehow this term has become more loaded in its usage. 
So this is actually the definition from the International Organization for Migration of who a migrant is. It's a very all-encompassing definition. So it's any person who is moving or has moved uh, across an international border or within a state away from his or her habitual place of residence, regardless of the person's legal status, whether the movement is voluntary or involuntary, what the causes for that movement are, or what the length of stay is. So this is extremely wide and open. Practically, when we actually do research in migration or when migrants are counted, we do give some kind of time threshold where it would be kind of impossible to, to, to count people. But it's really about moving the place of habitual residence. So what's important to understand is that migrants make up many more people than just that list that I told you of what comes to mind. So the International Organization for Migration actually created a campaign called an I Am a Migrant campaign, which shows just personal stories of people from all walks of life, from all over the world, showing their migration stories. Now at, at Maastricht University and UNU Merit, we've done something similar. So with our own staff members, we've started a blog series called Migration Stories. So it's like my own migration story. And pretty much everyone in their current story or in their parents' story somewhere has a migration story. And the idea of this blog is to really normalize migration because it actually is normal. It's a part of human nature. Um, and to, to start to see migrants as people and mobility as something that's inherent to all of us. So that's one of the key uh, um, myths already around migration. Another misconception is that poverty is the main cause of migration. So again, people immediately thinking, oh, if you're coming here or there or whatever, it's because you're poor, you're escaping poverty. Well, if that were the case, then I wouldn't be living in the Netherlands. Many of you would have never gone to Maastricht University. If poverty was what's driving so much of the migration we see today, then basically none of you and I would also be migrating. So there are, there are loads of reasons why people migrate, and I'll explain some of those. They can be both forced and voluntary, and often this is also overlapping, so there's not, it's not always very straightforward if, some, if a migration is completely voluntary or completely forced. Some of the typical reasons for migration, on the forced side at least, are conflict, violence, war, persecution. Um, also, environmental factors are playing more and more of a role. Um, now, on a more voluntary side, we also have looking for access to services, and this does not necessarily mean um, from a poverty perspective. So, uh, I might um, want health care that is only available in one country. It doesn't mean that that health care isn't that health care good health care isn't available in my country, but maybe there's a very specific specialist. Um, in another country, let's say in Switzerland, where I can go to get something done. One of the largest reasons for my migration is actually family reasons, and this is something that most people don't realize. So family, what we call family reunification and family formation is usually in the first or second place as to why someone is migrating. So this means someone migrates to um, follow a family member, so maybe one person gets a job somewhere and the rest of the family also joins them at that job abroad. Maybe some of you were also the children of diplomats or people who moved around a lot. But then we also have family formation. So this is migration for love. You meet someone, you fall in love, and then you also, that person maybe moves to where you are. So this is not necessarily about poverty, it's not necessarily about making more money, but um, it, family is basically the second most important reason why we see people migrating nowadays. Education. Education is another important reason why people are migrating, and we see it becoming more and more important over time. We have around 5 million um, uh, migrants today just for studying higher education, for instance, in, in other countries. Then retirement is another one that people often don't think about at all. But often, when people retire, they want to go to another country, maybe where there's more sun, where the weather is better, possibly where the food's better, maybe where their money goes further. So retirement is also another reason for migration. Now, the number one reason for migration in the world is for jobs or labor. But again, this doesn't mean for poverty. 
So I myself also would be categorized as a labor migrant. I'm working in the Netherlands under a knowledge migrant visa, so I would also go under that category, but that doesn't mean it's because of poverty. And this is again where um, there are a lot of misconceptions. Then we have lifestyle migration. And this is, we see this kind of migration of people more in their 20s, it doesn't have to be, but it's more associated with people in their 20s, who just want to see new things, experience different cultures, um, and it's really just part of a, of, of a lifestyle choice. And in general, of course, better opportunities encompass a large portion of, of things, and that could be um, possibly better jobs or working in a more interesting field. It could be um, getting access to uh, a, a country that is more welcoming or more liberal or whatever. There are a lot of things that can be encompassed in better opportunities. It's also important to realize that most people, when they're making their decisions to migrate, it's not based on only one reason. There might be one reason that is a bit more important or a leading reason, but usually people are making these decisions um, for multiple reasons. So here, I just have two examples. One is of a kind of typical, very voluntary type of migration. So person one here, let's say they're migrating to the United States for education, so they want to go to the university in the US. Um, so officially, they have a student visa. Officially, they've migrated for educational purposes. But when that person made that decision to go study in the United States, they're, they're also thinking about the fact that, well, if I have a degree from the United States, it also is easier for me to get a work visa in the U.S. after that. So bundled into their decision making for education is also future job prospects. And then maybe also just better opportunities overall. Then if we take a more typical forced migration case, so someone who has migrated particularly because of war or conflict, let's take a Syrian nowadays. So, yes, it's dangerous in Aleppo, it's dangerous in Syria at the moment, so you want to leave. But at the same time, you have children. And because of the war, the hospitals have been bombed, the schools have been bombed, so your kids aren't going to school, you have no access to, to health or medical services, and maybe also access to even food and clean drinking water now is getting difficult. So these things are compounded onto each other. And then additionally, possibly half of your family has already fled and they're in another country. So not only is it dangerous and you have no access to services anymore, but you would also like to be living with your family again. So it's generally, again, multiple reasons, even in a case of typically um, involuntary migration as to why someone is migrating. Now, there's another misconception is that migration is currently at an all-time high and it's accelerating fast. So for some reason, especially the media likes to use a lot of water metaphors when talking about migration. So it's floods of people, it's waves of people, it's a tsunami, right? But if we actually look at the data, it, this doesn't really hold up. So this is uh, actually some work from um, a professor behind the house, who is another professor also at Maastricht University. This is a graph out of um, a book that he's just recently published, an updated version of the um, volume on, uh, on international migration. And here you can actually see how migration has changed over time from the 1960s. So yes, on one hand, in absolute terms, you can see that international migration has been increasing, but so has world population. So if you look at migration actually as a percentage of world population, it stayed pretty stable around 3% of the world population now for you know, 50, 60, 70 years. So this idea that we're really in an unprecedented situation, that you know, numbers are running rampant, all of this, is really just not true and often taken out of context. So another misconception is that um, refugees make up a large proportion of migrants. So when I asked you what comes to mind for migrants, someone said refugees. And I would say that is actually something that is, that is the case, especially nowadays in Europe. So when people often think about migrants, now they're thinking refugees. But actually refugees make up a very small proportion of international migrants nowadays. So we now have around 270 million international migrants in the world today, and only about 10% of those are refugees. It is true that we're at unprecedented numbers of refugees, so we've never seen this much displacement since World War II, and that is true. 
but still as a percentage of all the migrants in the world, refugees make up quite a small proportion of it. Now, there are a lot of misconceptions around where migrants are being hosted. Uh, so if I were to ask you what region in the world hosts the most migrants, so this is not specifically refugees, just of all migrants, where are migrants living? Which regions of the world? Middle East. Middle East. Okay, so you say Middle East. Anywhere else? Asia. 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 So I don't know. Yeah. So I would say the, the common perception from the general public is that people are being hosted all in Europe and the United States. All right, but in, uh, in actual terms, you'll see that Asia slightly beats out Europe. And Europe here doesn't mean EU, it means the continent of Europe. Um, so Asia is actually the number one host of migrants in the world today, with Europe in second place, North America in third place, then Africa and Latin America and Caribbean and Oceania are tied for last place in this regard. But now if we look at where migrants are going in absolute terms to countries, um, where do you think the most migrants in the world today are hosted? Lebanon. Someone said the Netherlands? Lebanon. Lebanon. Oh, Lebanon. Lebanon. Um, no, but I understand why you said it, because if we talk about refugees, it's a different, it, it's a different story. U.S., yes. So the United States is by far the number one country in the world for, for hosting migrants. Any other countries? UK. The UK is up there. So Canada? You say Canada? Yeah. So the Canada is up there, but it's not in the top five. <laughs> Germany is number two. Turkey. So, I think there are going to be some countries here that are, you guys are yelling out kind of the usual suspects of what people think, but almost always people miss at least half of the top five or six. So the top five here is the United States, Germany, Saudi Arabia is the number three country in the world for hosting migrants. Then the Russia, the UK, the United Arab Emirates is number six. Then we have France, Canada, Australia, Italy. Then if we go just to the top 20, we have Spain, Turkey, India, Ukraine, South Africa, Kazakhstan, Thailand, Malaysia, Jordan, and Pakistan. So there's a lot of countries in the world, and this is our top 20. So are there any countries here that surprised you? So people are usually first surprised by Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates being so high up on that list. And then people are often surprised by actually a lot of developing countries in the top 20 list. Because the common uh, uh, perception is that migrants are generally all being hosted in developed countries. But it's actually not true at all. This is now in absolute <laughs> terms. If we look at this in relative terms, so meaning as a percentage of the population, the numbers look actually very different, and there's almost no European country. The only European country here is Luxembourg. So that's, we all know that Luxembourg is a special case. <laughs> right? So this is looking at the percentage of the total population of the country. So in the UAE, in Kuwait, and Qatar, about more than 80% of those populations are made up of immigrants. I mean, that's, a, that's kind of unthinkable if you think about this in a European context. Right? And we have Liechtenstein, Brunei, Macau, Bahrain, Guam, Singapore, and then Luxembourg. So in all of these countries, we have more than 40% of their populations actually being made up of migrants. So if you think about what countries are actually hosting the most in more relative terms, these are actually the countries that are seeing the biggest impact from migration. And may I ask one thing? Mm -hmm. The migrant, in this case, is only international migrants, Yes. Right? It's not internal. Uh, it's not internal migrants. This is international migrant. But you bring up a good point. Does anyone know what country in the world has the largest internal migration? India? No? China. 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 So China is the country in the world with the largest internal migration, mainly from rural areas to urban centers. So another misconception is that refugees are mainly hosted in developed or European countries. This could actually not be further from the truth. So uh, um, if we look at the top 10 countries for where refugees are currently being hosted just in absolute terms, 
Turkey is now by far the number one country. Then we have Pakistan, Uganda, Sudan. Germany is newly on this list. Iran, Lebanon, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, and Jordan. Actually, 86% of all refugees today are actually hosted in developing countries. Because what usually happens in a conflict situation is that refugees just spill over borders. So they end up mainly staying in the same regions from which they come. And around 20%, maybe a little bit less, are actually hosted in least developed countries. So if you actually think about the countries who are maybe least capable, least able, having the fewest resources to be able to handle this more vulnerable population, it's exactly those countries that are being told to deal with it. So huge misconceptions, I would say, especially in Europe, about where refugees are actually being hosted. This is just in absolute terms. Now if we look at it in relative terms, so this is now as a percentage of the population of those countries, Lebanon and Jordan are surpassing everyone by far. And to be honest, they're also now keeping bad statistics, so these numbers are probably even higher. That means that in Lebanon, more than 15% of the Lebanese population now is made up only of refugees. All right, if you would like take that same magnitude and apply it to Germany, Germany should have taken about 10 million more refugees. Right? Just to, or more, just to put things a little bit into perspective. So here we have Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, Chad, Uganda, Sudan, Sweden, South Sudan, Malta, and Djibouti, as far as in uh, um, relative terms, hosting the highest numbers of refugees. Now, another misconception is where migrants are coming from. So, uh, what countries in the world do you think are the largest senders in absolute terms of migrants? And the Philippines? Philippines, Philippines is up there. <laughs> India. India is up there. China. China is up there. So, India and China are, are up there. Mexico, so we have India in the first place, Mexico in the second place, China. Russia, both a sender and a receiver. Syria now, which was not the case, you know, eight years ago. Um, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Ukraine, Philippines, Afghanistan. But our top 20, we go Indonesia, Poland, the UK, Germany, Kazakhstan, Palestine, Myanmar, Romania, Egypt, and Turkey. Are there any countries on this list that surprise you? The UK? Maybe Germany. So people are usually surprised that the UK and Germany are among the top countries in the world actually sending migrants. And just about two years ago, UK was actually in the top 10. Which, given the current kind of political situation and rhetoric in the UK, seems a bit paradoxical um, that they're actually one of the major migrant sending countries in the world, not just migrant receiving countries. So another misconception is that mo most migration is from developing countries to developed countries. So if you would look at the news, if you would look at the policy debates, you would think that all of the migration in the world today, or most of it, is going from developing countries to developed countries. But in reality, it's actually quite different. So most of the policy and rhetoric in this course is focused on this bit. So here, read South as developing country, North as developed country. So about 35% of all international migration today is from developing countries to developed countries. That's just a third of what's going on. A bit more than that, so about 38% is actually going from developing countries to other developing countries. This is often completely misunderstood and completely missed in a kind of policy debates. Then another big chunk is actually moving from developed countries to other developed countries. So that's like me living in the Netherlands, for instance. And we even have a group that has, is actually moving from developed countries to developing countries. This is a smaller group. This is generally made up of, of aid workers, NGO workers, UN, um, UN workers, and retirees. So this is, a, this is a smaller number, but the picture is actually quite different than what you might see in the media and the policy discourse. What's different about this group is that when this group is discussed, the terminology that is used for this group is completely different, which is also not really correct. So um, 
When we talk about this migration, it, people are not often called migrants. They're called expats, or they're called highly skilled workers, or they're called something else that has more positive connotations. So that's one of the reasons why people don't think of this group as migrants when they actually are. Now, another misconception is really with regard to the relationship between migration and development. So there's a common misconception that with development, migration will stop, and that if we just invest more in developing countries, if we just send more aid, then people will stop migrating from those countries. This is how a lot of policy is being made currently, and it couldn't be more misguided. So if we actually look at some evidence on this, this is again um, a graph that Professor Heine Haas put together to show the relationship between migration and development. So the relationship on immigrants, so, so people coming into countries, is very clear and straightforward. Basically, as your country develops, you will attract more and more immigrants. Your country becomes more and more interesting to go to. So this is not just about income level, this is using the human development index. So this is taking more into account than just income. So very clear, as your country develops, you become more attractive for migrants. But the relationship on immigration or leaving your country is quite different. And it follows what we call an inverted U-shape. So you can see it kind of, it, it increases, decreases, but not so much. So what we see is that actually at low and very low levels of development, we also see very low levels of migration. We see the least migration from actually the countries that people seem to think the most migration is coming from. Then we see high rates of migration around middle development. It goes down a bit, but actually doesn't drop too dramatically, both in high and very high um, development countries. It's still much higher here than it is in a low development context. So why do you think it is that we see such low migration from low developed countries when you could argue that the payoff for migration would probably be the highest for this group? They don't have the means to migrate. Exactly, so it's a multiple factors, and one of the important ones is that they don't have the means to migrate in the first place. So migration takes resources, it takes capital, and you, you need to have that. Um, it also takes networks. It also helps if you already have contacts outside of your country. Um, that means you need to also know about what's possible outside. You also generally need to have some kinds of education or skills that are interesting for other countries. And you also need a policy context that is welcoming to you. And none of that is generally the case for this group of countries. Now when we come to the middle income side here, you start to see that people have more skills. So in this side, a lot of migrants have at least secondary education, for instance. Think of countries like Mexico or the Philippines, where there's a decent level of education, but actually wage differentials are still high enough between countries that it still really makes it worth their while to make that move. And now other countries are interested in these people because they have skills, even if it's lower skills that they're interested in. Then when we come here, all of a sudden we get into the global race for talent and trying to attract the best and the brightest. So once you get here, all the countries in the world are saying, oh yes, please come, please come. We'll give you tax breaks, we'll give you other things, we'll make it easy for you to come here. And now you have skills, you have networks, you have all the things you need to make this move easy, more easy. So what actually changes with development is not uh, people deciding that they're not going to migrate. It's more our perception of those migrants. So at this stage, the perception is, no, 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 we don't want you. Here it's like, yes, okay, we're a bit more interested. And here it's like, please, please, please come. So that's actually what changes with development. And that's, a very, that's very much commonly misunderstood in the discussions around migration and development. So nowadays, it is you, but also in, in other countries, you see a lot of development money and development aid being thrown at countries, kind of with the explicit purpose for people to not migrate. I mean, you can talk about the moral foundations of that from one side, but just practically, that doesn't make any sense. If we assume that development aid even does stimulate development, which there's a lot of evidence against that, or you would need it to be much, much higher, then the aid is going here. As these countries would develop, we would expect to actually see an increase in migration. We just might be more receptive to that migration. So this relationship is much more nuanced than is often discussed. 
Then another common misconception is that migration restrictions will actually um, produce migration. So we see here that uh, there, are, there are a lot of policies made around trying to reduce migration, and they often have um, alternative consequences. So this is just one example, again, from some of the work of Professor Hein de Haas. Um, I'm taking an example from the Netherlands now, since that's where I, where I work. Um, this is Suriname. So Suriname is a former colony of the Netherlands in the Caribbean, just north of Brazil. So what happened? Um, in Suriname, of course, there were discussions around independence. And one of the discussions in Parliament at that time to actually give Suriname independence was to also stop migration from Suriname, which at that time was considered a bit unwanted. It was still at very low levels um, at that time. But what happened actually when Suriname gained independence was that people could choose for either a Dutch passport or a Surinamese passport. What happened? Effectively, half of the country decided for a Dutch passport and left the country. Now, these were a lot of people that had never actually planned to migrate previously, but when given an ultimatum, they made that choice. We call this migration now or never migration, or beat the ban migration. So it's, okay, maybe I never planned to do this before, but I don't want that channel to be cut off forever, so I better do it now before I lose that possibility forever. And so we see a huge spike at independence. We also see a big spike when visas were introduced from the Netherlands. So just before visas were introduced, also another very large group of, of migration um, to the Netherlands. What's interesting is we actually have comparable cases in the Caribbean where those countries did not gain independence. So you have French Guiana that looks very similar to Suriname, never gained independence, and the migration has stayed extremely stable over time with no real peaks. So, a direct consequence of actually trying to, in a way, ban migration increased migration dramatically. And in this period, basically, half of the country left and went to the Netherlands. So the exact opposite of what the Netherlands was trying to achieve at that time. Um, so what's important to understand here is that migration restrictions do not necessarily reduce migration at all. They often change the nature of the movements. They mainly change the way in which people move, so through different channels. Um, they also can affect who migrates in a given time, but they don't change kind of the underlying processes driving migration like development, social transformations, and labor markets. Now, there are a lot of misconceptions on how, um, on how many migrants are actually living in destination countries, so you can probably already guess where I'm going. So in most countries where the population is asked what percentage of migrants are actually living in your countries, there are gross overestimations of how many migrants there are in countries. So um, this is from a survey called the Perils of Perception. It's from lots of different OECD countries. I'll zoom into some other countries in a bit. Um, but here, um, the, the question is, what percentage of the population do you think are immigrants? So people not born in your country. And in almost every country where this, this is asked, it is overestimated. So in Argentina, for instance, the actual amount is 5%, but people th but think that it's 30%. So this is just outrageously different than it actually is. Mm -hmm. um, in Belgium here, um, it's actually around 10%, and the guess was a quarter, so around 20%. Um, in Germany, it was around 12%, and the guess was 26%. So there are really big differences between perceptions and realities in most countries. Here, if we zoom in to a few other um, OECD countries, you can see here, the groups that should actually be considered as immigrants are just first generation, people who were not born in that country and moved to that country. But because often in perceptions of people, they often still consider the children of migrants immigrants, which is not the case. We also take that into account here and still see the gross overestimations in countries. So in Hungary, the estimation was 15% of the population is immigrants, when actually 5% is. In Poland, the estimation was 
16% when it's actually 2%, and on and on. In the UK, um, also overestimated, but if you see if you add up first and second generation, it's getting a little bit closer to reality, but it's still an overestimation in every single country. In Italy, the estimation was almost a third of the population, while in reality it's 10%. Um, in Belgium, where we are now, the, the guess was again around a third of the population when it is 11%. In the US, again, it's about, the guess was around 30% when it's really 15. Germany, again, it's only 15% of the population. Spain, an even bigger gap, the guess was around 30% and it's actually 13. So you can see in kind of every country, there's a huge overestimation of how many migrants are actually in the country. Then there are really big mismatches in perceptions of migrant characteristics. So what, are, what migrants are like, what kinds of characteristics they have. So one of the first big ones is um, the perceived versus actual share of Muslim immigrants in the country. I guess you guys all know where I'm going with this. Do you think they're overestimating or underestimating? Probably overestimating, yep. All right, so this is some research from uh, uh, the US, UK, Sweden, Italy, Germany, and France. And in every country but France, the estimation is just grossly out of whack. So in Germany, the perception is that about 45% of immigrants are Muslim, when effectively it's 30%. In the US, um, it's seen as more like a quarter of, of, of all immigrants, when it's really only 10%. So it's really gross overestimations of the number of Muslims in the country. If we look at this on the other side, the perception of Christian immigrants. So what, do you, what direction do you think it's going now? There's some underestimation of who is Christian. So in, in almost every country, big underestimation of Christian migrants. And this seems to be even bigger than the overestimation of Muslim migrants. So in Italy, for instance, the perception is that it's about a quarter of the population, when in reality it's over half of the immigrant population. It at least identifies as Christian. So really big overestimations in every country here. Even France, who previously got it right, more or less, who was Muslim, gets it still way wrong who's Christian. And in all cases, they're underestimating. Then, there another perception is that um, my immigrants aren't working. Um, you, or you could also think of Schrodinger's migrant, who is simultaneously too lazy to work and stealing your job at the same time. So basically, there's no possibility for a migrant to win. They're either working too much or not enough. But here we'll just look at unemployment rates. So uh, um, which way do you think um, uh, the perception is, an overestimation or an underestimation? So in all countries, there is an extreme gross overestimation of the unemployment rate of immigrants. So let's look at the country that has the largest swing, Germany. The population thinks that 40% of immigrants are unemployed, when in fact it's like 6 or 7%. So this is just, I mean, so far away from reality, and it's very big in every country. So probably Sweden has the smallest gap, but it's still big, with the population thinking about 36% of the population um, being unemployed, when in fact it's about 15%. So huge, huge differences here. And this is where a lot of this, these kind of negative connotations around migrants come from, from just completely wrong perceptions about migrants. The last one I want to show you on the perceptions of migrants is having to do with crime. Because there's also this idea that migrants create more crime than natives, at least. So this question asks, out of every 10 prisoners in your country, about how many do you think were born in a foreign country? And you can see, again, just gross overestimations of the prison population that is foreign in almost every country. The only countries that actually underestimated are Hong Kong and Saudi Arabia. Um, there are quite some countries here who are actually pretty close. So Montenegro, Sweden, Malaysia, Israel are actually much closer to what the real reality is. Why do you think in Saudi Arabia it's so grossly underestimated in the opposite direction than most other countries? Because they're 
might associate my brothers with expats, so they're well free, they can live in the Unicorn Not unicorns? It's a good guess, but that's not necessarily. Does anyone know much about the context of Saudi Arabia? You can only work there, you can only get there on a working visa. We, so well, you can basically only or, go there for or, work, but they have no or kind or of refugee status or anything like that. Yes, but the important point here is that immigrants in Saudi Arabia have almost no rights. And it is very, very easy to end up in prison as a foreigner in Saudi Arabia. Um, so basically, if you leave your employer because they are beating you or withholding your pay, and you leave them, that is unlawful. So you can be thrown in prison for that. So it takes almost no offense, effectively, to end up in prison. And I think, and the general public doesn't realize how easy it is to end up in prison, basically. So this is not people um, committing the same kind of offenses <laughs> as in the Netherlands for what you would go to prison for. These are really things as basic as not doing something your employer tells you to do or leaving an abusive situation, which there is a lot of abuse also um, in the Gulf context with migrants and in, Saudi, and in Saudi Arabia. But most migrants have almost no recourse to do anything about it. So these are some of the biggest um, misconceptions around migration that probably many of you have heard. I hope now that I've been able to debunk some of these myths. Obviously, there are a lot more out there. Um, if you're interested to find out more about more myths or just more information about migration, I've just recently launched uh, a YouTube channel dealing with migration issues for the general public. If you're interested, please go check it out, like, subscribe, whatever. If there are people in your immediate network who you also think have a lot of misunderstanding of migration, please send it to them. One of the main reasons I um, decided to launch such a channel is because I think not enough digestible, digestible information is getting out to the general public. So it's there now, if you're interested. I'll leave it there, and I think we are just in time. So I'm happy to also answer any questions you guys might have.